It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast, presented by our good friends at Smoky Mountain Organics, East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store, focusing on natural products, organic remedies for a variety of ailments. That's Smoky Mountain Organics. Check them out online, SmokyMountainOrganics.com, or visit one of their four locations in East Tennessee, three in, in Sevier County, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Sevierville, and of course, their location in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike, just down from Westtown Mall. With Austin Price and Ben McKee, I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you along with us on this Tuesday installment of the podcast. This may be a first, but when you're the top-ranked team in the country, this is where it goes first on your podcast. We're going to open this podcast talking about the Tennessee baseball team dominant on Friday and Saturday in Oxford and then completing the sweep on Sunday uh, with a little bit of a scary 4-3 win, but dominant Friday night, 12-1, 10-3 on Saturday. They outscore the Rebels 26-7. Tennessee is number one in every poll around the country. Ben McKee, my question for you is this. Is this team really that good? Did Ole Miss have a really bad day Is it or a bad weekend, or is it a combination of both things for this team? It's a combination of both things from my perspective. Even talking to some of the Ole Miss writers, they, they kind of expected for Ole Miss to get slapped around. Now, I didn't think Tennessee was going to slap around Ole Miss the way Will Smith did to Chris Rock, but uh, that is what took place. And it's because of Ole Miss's lack of pitching that has got them in trouble. And and my prediction was that Tennessee was going to win the series. And I thought it was because Tennessee had the pitching to handle the Ole Miss lineup to whereas Ole Miss did not have the pitching to handle Tennessee's lineup. So uh, I I do think the pitching for Ole Miss – uh, has been masked by how great of an offense they have. So not surprised that Tennessee was able to put up runs, but what was surprising to me was how Tennessee was able to put up or uh, how Tennessee's pitchers were able to hold the Ole Miss lineup in check. That was one of the best lineups in the country entering the weekend, and the lineup for Ole Miss is why they were ranked so highly, and, and they were uh, statistically ranked high in several categories, on base percentage, home runs, uh, runs scored, so on and so forth, and Chase Burns set the tone Friday night, and so did Chase Dolander on Saturday and Drew Beam. Uh, So I do think Tennessee is legitimately the best team in the country as we flip the calendar uh, to April at this point. And I understand there's a long way to go, but I I do think they should be viewed as the front runner to win the title right now, as crazy as that sounds. And uh, I, I do think the unanimous number one ranking is legitimate. But also, I do think that Ole Miss isn't as as good as maybe their ranking indicated just because of their pitching. Uh, their, their pitching is is not very good. And I think long term, when we look up at the end of the season, Ole Miss is going to be sitting at home pretty early because of the lack of pitching, unless they have some guys really step up and, and uh, do something productive the rest of the way. So basically what you're telling me, Ben, is that was the Tennessee baseball version of them saying, keep the yellow golf ball out your mouth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It, it's, I mean, look, Tennessee's gotten lots of notoriety for hitting a bunch of home runs and scoring a bunch of runs. And um, what's the old, uh, the old Nike commercial chicks dig the long ball or whatever the case <laughs> it, it is. And that's true. But I mean, as crazy as it sounds, Ben, has this pitching staff really not gotten its due to this point because of all the home runs? I mean, it was, Was this weekend the the weekend that put the pitching staff on the map? Yes, absolutely. And we always knew the potential was there. Chase Burns is a professional pitcher at 18 years old, and he should not be in college. The fact that he's in college is just simply amazing. Even his own teammates are surprised that he's in college because of how he pitched in high school and how he pitched on the summer circuit for travel ball. Uh, And – he, he's been well-known. Everybody's well aware of Chase Burns. But I don't feel like Chase Dolander was getting his his due. And he's a guy that, from the moment he committed before Tennessee left for Omaha last year, uh, committed to transfer to Tennessee out of Georgia Southern, he, he's a guy that the staff viewed as a future first-round pick. And, and you saw why on Saturday. He's got a fastball that sits upper 90s. He's touching 99 in the first inning. And when he's still in there in the seventh inning, 
it's not much of a dip off in velocity. He's still upper 90s. I think it was 96, 97 or so. so a filthy slider as well that he mixes in. And uh, he, he's a future first round pitcher if he can stay healthy as well. And he hasn't been as efficient as he was on Saturday to this point. So I, I even think amongst Tennessee fans that he wasn't getting his credit because when you, when you mentioned Blake Tidwell, fans wanted to mention, hey, why don't we just put Tate Holder in the bullpen and slide Blake Tidwell into that Saturday spot so we don't have to mess with Drew Bean. But I was kind of hesitant towards that plan just because I think Chase Dolander has more long-term potential, at least within this season, than Drew Bean does just because his, his stuff is a little bit better than Beam's at the moment. And so that's why I was kind of hesitant because I knew that what we saw Saturday – is what the Tennessee coaching staff was expecting long-term from Dolander. And then Beam, I mean, he just continues to amaze me. The, the fact that his first SEC start, he has a perfect game going into the seventh inning, and then uh, yesterday doesn't give up a hit until the, the third or fourth inning, I believe it was, and, and really kept Ole Miss off the bases all day long. Again, you against have, one of the better lines in the country is today. amazing. He gave up three, three hits. hits total. He gave up a two singles and a double. <laughs> yep. And, and the, the double was towards the end when, when he was starting to, to wear down. I know a lot of people were kind of questioning why Tony went to the bullpen and didn't leave Beam out there for another batter or two. But his, his velo had really dropped off. He was hitting 95, 96 in the first inning. And there in that last inning, the seventh inning, or, or the eighth inning, I guess it was, uh, he was sitting around 90, 91. So his velo had really dropped off, and he had lost command of the strike zone. Um, and that was when one of the three hits happened. So he was really efficient. So, yes, Brent, I, I think that Tennessee's pitching staff had not get, gotten total respect up until this weekend, and mainly because of some of the competition Tennessee has played to this point as well. Yeah, when you're scoring 27 runs or whatever it is in a game and you're hitting, you know, it, it's batting practice against the opponent's pitchers, I guess that draws more uh, attention than, than pitching does. Frank Anderson's been great for his entire career at, at what he does. I, I don't know if you're just now following Tennessee baseball or you're just kind of a casual fan. I don't know that everybody fully appreciates who Frank Anderson is. The most amazing thing to me, Ben, about – The Leo Mazzoni of this generation. The, the most amazing thing that, that, that Frank Anderson gets out of his pitching staff for, for me is just the fact of they throw strikes. They work fast. They throw strikes. I mean, they, they're in complete – control of the game from a tempo standpoint and they just don't they don't try to nibble at the plate I mean they, they come right after hitters and, and I think it takes a lot of confidence to do that but it's a system that Frank Anderson has used for a long time and um, it, it's a great system for Tennessee he has been for, for several years but with the talent he's got right now uh, it, it's perfection for Tennessee at least to start this year isn't it if you don't throw strikes you're not going to pitch for Frank Anderson. I mean, it's, it's really that simple. I mean, that is, that is at the top of the priority list for Frank Anderson when evaluating prospects out of high school and then uh, earning a, a Friday night role or starting role or key arm, uh, top arm out of the bullpen. That's why Kirby Connell pitches more than, than fans maybe think that he should because he goes in there and he throws strikes. Sure, he may give up the occasional long ball uh, because he, he doesn't have – uh, Drew Beam or Chase Burns type of stuff, but he just throws strikes and, and he's not going to get in the trouble because of the walk. And, and their thought process is that, okay, well, if they can throw strikes, if they have good fundamentals, then, then we can help them get, get the velo up on the fastball and, and we can help them find some more break on their, on their breaking balls and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, that is the, key ingredient to the staff and that's what stood out to me this this weekend as well uh Tennessee kept runners off base not only by not allowing a ton of hits but Burns Dolander and Beam I, I want to say two walks amongst the three uh total for the weekend and it's not like that they each pitched four innings I mean each guy pitched into the seventh and eighth inning and two walks combined amongst the three is remarkable Chase Dolander throws a hundred pitches eight So it's incredible, and, and I can guarantee you that, that is what Frank Anderson is most happy about this Monday morning. Well, I guess we're recording this for Tuesday, but 
uh, coming back to Knoxville, he's most happy about the, the two walks and the amount of strikes that were thrown because you're not going to pitch for Frank Anderson if you're not throwing strikes, regardless of how good your stuff is. All right, a couple of baseball things here before we move on, a couple more baseball things before we move on to, to football and, and football recruiting, uh, among other things going on at, at Tennessee. One is for as great as it was this weekend, Ben, Tennessee was not very good behind the pitchers in terms of uh, how they fielded the baseball, a lot, lot of mistakes, uh, a lot of errors, um, a lot of simple plays that looked like they, they did not make. One, how big of a concern is that for, for Tennessee? And two, in a bizarre way, how big of a concern is that for the rest of the league that Tennessee was as dominant as they were, uh, particularly for two games, and was in complete control until the eighth inning in the Sunday game, yet they didn't field it very well behind. I mean, Tennessee can play better um, than what they played this weekend. From both perspectives, where does that stand? I'm not too concerned about the fielding, mainly because it's still somewhat early but it definitely needs to improve. Uh, middle of the pack in the SEC right now, uh, I, I looked it up this morning. I, I believe it was eighth um, worst or eighth best, however you want to word it, fielding percentage in the SEC. They're eighth in the SEC in fielding percentage and error. So uh, middle of the pack, and uh, I'm, I've kind of raised my eyebrow at it. Some of the errors this weekend were uncharacteristic. Well, they were just uh, so, so maybe plays. It, Yes, exactly. Cortland Lawson dropping, just dropping the baseball uh, at, at second base while trying to, trying to turn the double play. Jarrell Ortega letting one go between his legs. Uh, Trey Lipscomb taking an extra hop at third and then sailing the throw into the stands. Luke was credited for an error on a, on a ground ball that he bobbled, and then he tried to recover and get it back to first and, and kind of rushed it. Uh, I thought that was just more of a difficult play than just a, a true error. So uh, some of them have been uncharacteristic and just simple as Austin said, but also I'm not con too concerned at the moment just because defense has been a staple under Tony Vitello just as throwing strikes for Frankie Anderson has been, and, and I, I think they'll get it sorted out, and I think the SEC should be concerned. Tennessee has asserted itself as the best team not only in the conference but in the country, and they, they did not play their best baseball. I, I believe it was Redmond Walsh uh, after – uh, Sunday's game that told me the, the mood after Saturday's game when Tennessee nearly won by 10 runs again was as if they lost the game because they they made some errors at the end and didn't play their best baseball. So I, I think the rest of the SEC and the country should be concerned because defense has always been something that, it's, that has been really good for Tennessee under Vitello, and they'll figure it out down the road and to beat a team like Tennessee you're going to need more than 27 outs and and when they get that shirt up you, you're not going to have that advantage well they were impressive this weekend of course the challenge for Tennessee coming up on next weekend uh, this coming weekend is a trip to Music City to take on a Vanderbilt team who desperately must win a home series after losing a series on the road against South Carolina uh, ben and, and Eric and everybody will get you ready for that uh, later this week with the, the podcast and the preview, and we'll have full coverage of everything from Nashville as Tennessee takes on uh, Vanderbilt and a key SEC series. If Tennessee can find a way to win both of these series on the road uh, with a sweep at Ole Miss, that, that would be an unbelievable start uh, and probably uh, surpassing anything Tony Vitello and his staff had uh, on their on their preseason calendar when they talked about, you know, games you could win and series you could win and those types of things, it would be a great start for Tennessee. So full coverage of that coming up as uh, later this week. Uh, one thing to pass along, I know that um, Tennessee Athletic Director Danny White got um, a, a lot of uh, retweets and a lot of buzz about his tweet regarding a stadium and, and the fact that uh, somebody tweeted that, tweeted that Tennessee baseball needed a, a top flight top-notch stadium for uh, Tony Vitello and Danny White replied that it was coming. Just a quick calendar update for everybody to kind of understand where this stuff works, how it works. You got to get it on the docket in the state government and the state um, with the way that th those projects have to get on there and get approval. Look for Tennessee when the new fiscal year starts, July 1st, look for Tennessee to move rapidly forward in terms of getting contractors in place, architects hired, finalizing designs. There's obviously some preliminary stuff already done, but look for that movement to really start 
July 1. It can't start before then because of the fiscal year and the way that you have to do those things through the state government. So July 1 is the key date there to start to see some movement. I think you'll hear much more buzz about uh, what's going on with, with the stadium um, renovations and things like that before July 1. But you're not going to see, as soon as the baseball season ends, you're not going to see dirt start digging up and things like that. But you are going to see movement, I think, pretty quickly uh, once we get to the new fiscal year, which starts on July 1 uh, with, with the baseball stadium. Well, we're where will the uh, Brent Hubs grandstands be for the uh, new baseball stadium? Well, I mean, I'm the Austin Price ones. I started to say, I, my, mine's going to be underneath the porches because Austin's going to have, uh, he's going to have ownership of the porches out there. And, and what's, uh, we're going to name that, you know, they got Wait, they, Austin's Alley, baby. Yeah, Austin's, Austin's Alley. Alley. I mean, he, he's Price's gonna, porch. Come he's on, gonna, baby. He's, he's going to. He's going to turn that into what is that in Phoenix at the at the uh, TPC in Phoenix? You know that's oh, uh, going to be 16, the yeah, stadium hole. The stadium hole. That's going to be Austin's world there. <laughs> so, yeah, and then we'll have Brent's box next to it. Yeah, and it'll be a matchbox. Brent's um, box. <laughs> a life of a, a box of despair, loneliness, and Eeyore like tendencies. Thank you. You're very kind. I appreciate you. I feel I feel greatly respected on this podcast <laughs> today. All right, Austin. Let's, let's talk a little spring football here. Speaking of respected, Rodney Garner on Monday wasn't exactly exuding uh, just uh, respecting his kids. I don't mean to say that, but he wasn't he wasn't putting anybody's bust in the Hall of Fame uh, anytime soon, which is not a surprise. Tennessee is a little over a week into spring practice. G give us a, a ten thousand foot view of, of where you think of, of what you've seen out of this team, where you think they are right now before they head into their first major scrimmage this weekend. Typical spring, you know, I mean, just kind of, you know, some of those young kids are going to get plenty of run. Um, you're not going to know a whole lot about this team until the fall because they're so depleted in the secondary. Um, you know, so whatever, you know, I, I will say this. I, I thought Jimmy, and they've talked to Jimmy Holiday about moving to, to secondary, but he's drawn some praise through the first four practices. And, 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 and Golish talked about, you know, just how much more comfortable Callaway, Holiday, just some of those – kids that had never really played a whole lot of receiver until they got here were now that they're in year three in the program, third spring and all that. So, you know, I'm not saying he's going to burst onto the scene. I'm just saying, you know, it, it, it certainly feels like he's going to stay at receiver for now. Um, does it feel like there's any kind of imminent move, any type of mid spring move to see what he could look like? Um, and, you know, I, I just kind of think you are kind of where you are, you know, you hope that, you know, Justin Williams, Thomas, you hope that Caleb Webb, um, you know, Chaz Nimrod, some of those younger players continue to come along and show they can help you. And then you, you, you need to get Brew McCoy in the boat. You need to, you know, he wraps up his visit, you know, later today and, you know, can be a nice addition to go opposite Cedric Tillman. We saw him out there, Brent. Brew McCoy is a big man. <laughs> He's a big kid. And so, you know, they can, they can continue to use uh, as many bodies as they can get. And, you know, again, I think Tennessee will be active in the portal post spring practice. What do you think that, what do you expect coming out of the first scrimmage? I mean, do you think it's just going to be a lot of offensive, you know, plays being made and that's that, that they're going to be uh, beyond where the defense is right now? Or do you think this defensive front with Tennessee uncertain at offensive tackle that, that, that Byron Young's got another step in him, that he's making that step right now. Tyler Barron, you know, making a step. I mean, do you, you think it's going to be a little more even, I guess is what I'm saying, versus, man, they can't stop anybody at the corner position. They're going to throw it over everybody's head all the time. Well, I mean, I think they're going to make plenty of plays through the air in spring ball just because you are, you know, throwing against, you know, some lesser experienced guys. But I do think Tennessee's got a chance to also – get to the quarterback a little bit more and not, you know, of course it's non-contact with, with Hendon and those guys, um, you know, with, you know, Tyler Barron seeming to be more focused and, and having a kind of a, a crisp first, you know, handful of practices, Byron Young's continued growth, um, you know, so, I mean, I think it depends on that, the kind of front group, you know, whether it be the outside guys or even just the, the down linemen, you know, can they get, can they get home enough in spring to, kind of kill the lack of, you know, playmakers in the secondary. Do you think they want to play Darnell Wright at right tackle? And yes. it's about finding a left tackle, whether he's on the roster or whether they find a way to get a transfer. Is that is that the, the ideal scenario? Is that where they want to go? 
I think so. Um, you know, I think that's where he wants to be. That's where he told me he wanted to be back in February when he came out for the locker room. He's comfortable playing either side, but he certainly feels like that, you know, the right side's where he's more natural, which is funny because he only played left in high school. And the first time he played right was, you know, when he first got here because they put Wanye at left and he was been out of shape. I remember talking to his high school coach. I mean, you know, he wouldn't, he didn't, he did not want to be a right tackle. And then all of a sudden I think he's figured out, you know, I, I can play left, but actually right is probably my more natural position, you know. And so if they can find a left tackle, then I think that's where he'll be. Which is interesting because most guys want to be left because they're the more highly coveted guy in terms of the next level. But it certainly feels like he, he's more comfortable there and he thinks he can improve his stock more as a right tackle than as a left tackle in terms of, of playing you know, at the, at the next level in, in the National Football League. So it, it's a bit unusual, but it, it does seem very clear that, that he's most comfortable there, and that feels like that's where Tennessee uh, w- would like to play him if the opportunity pr- presents itself. G- give me a thumbnail on Taven Jackson. What, what do you think of the way he throws the ball? I mean, we saw the high school tape. They're, you know, they're running in grass that's two and a half feet, you know, tall, it seems like. It seemed like it rained every game. They did not throw it a whole lot. What What do you make of what you've seen from Taven Jackson at this point? Calm. Uh, he He just seems like he just kind of fits in there like an old like an old glove. You know he does. You know and what what and again and what we get to see. Right. You know he, he doesn't seem like he's rattled by any of the speed of practice while we're out there. The repetition in practice. Now, what's he like when the bullets start flying and he's actually in eleven eleven work? I don't know. You know, um, but you know when we're out there, he's. He seems very much one that's kind of, you know, at ease with, you know, the speed of everything, how he's being coached, how they practice, all of that. Yeah, it's a great point about the 11 on 11. You just don't know how somebody's going to respond, or we don't get to see how they respond when it gets, you know, crowded and and there's more guns on the field. Because if you go out and watch practice, Joe Bilton still throws the best ball of anybody out there when, when we're out there during warm-up drills. I mean, it's effortless and – um, it's, it's accurate, but it does, it had obviously last year did not translate the way it needed to. When you got into game action, you got 11 guys, uh, on the field for sure. I, any other freshmen that, that, I mean, well, I know we've talked about a lot of these guys. Is there a guy that's, you know, you think is going to be a, maybe a better player or a more impactful player early than you thought, or maybe a guy who's not getting as much talked about as, as some, you know, as Justin Williams, Thomas and some other guys out there. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, ultimately the guy that's kind of laying in the weeds at the receiver spot right now is Coral White. You know, I mean, I think people, you know, have, have really kind of gravitated towards Chaz Nimrod thus far. Um, you know, you just don't hear as much about, you know, Squirrel White or Caleb Webb. Um, but that well, Webb, mean, mi- Webb did miss a couple of days. Well, he did because he was sick. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, I, I think that they're just kind of like more laying there in the weeds on some of this stuff. I mean, I think Elijah Herring, because of the position he plays is, you know, he's going to have the chance to earn playing time. Um, and, and then Tyree West on the defensive line continue to hear, you know, um, from a gifted standpoint, he's, he's got that uh, extra gear that, you know, could help him get to the field earlier than uh, some others. Yeah, I like I like West Burst. I mean, I think he comes off the ball really well. We'll see how well he can use his hands and all those things when it gets into – as we get into full contact and scrimmage and all those types of stuff. But uh, he's a guy that um, – you, you see why a lot of people liked him and why Florida State was so disappointed uh, when they didn't get him and Tennessee mm-hmm. got him at the end because he, he's a guy who athletically has shown himself well. All right, let's flip it to some recruiting stuff here. Uh, right quick, you mentioned Brew McCoy was in town. We've talked about the transfer portal, Tennessee trying to get there. But, but Austin, they had a, a good number of guys in on the practice field on Saturday, more guys in on Monday. Seemingly, they're, 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 they're having a regular um, bevy of guys come in for, for each practice, which I think is a positive sign for Tennessee. A lot of them are younger guys, but that's a positive sign that they're getting him here. It does feel like Tennessee's got a little different juice right now. Is that just the Nico effect, or is this the effect of the, the last year working in state, doing what they're getting, what they've gotten done, having some guys here who were underclassmen a year ago that are going to be seniors this year? What, what do you what do you equate to kind of the seemingly positive vibe on where Tennessee is recruiting wise right now? It's a little bit of both. I mean, 
you know, uh, the, you know, the, the good vibes on Nathan Robinson, the good vibes on, you know, a bunch of these in-state kids is the work you put in in the last year, you know, having good vibes about the Bradley kid from Missouri or, you know, um, anybody else that's not from the state is to me a little bit of the Nico effect. I mean, kids, you know, want to play with a good quarterback. They want to play with somebody that, you know, gives a program a little bit of juice. Tennessee's instantly the cool school. And, um, you know, that's why they're, you know, heavily in play for, a bunch of players a year ago, they struggled to get to 21, 22 high school kids committed. I don't think they'll struggle to get to 25 if they want to take 25 in this class. Does it surprise you that the quarterback has that kind of effect on defensive guys nope. um, or, or non-receivers, I guess is what I'm saying. Does that surprise you in any way? It, it doesn't. I mean, quarterbacks are the leaders. And, you know, uh, I think that, you know, if you're a good defensive player, you want to go someplace that you – you feel like can put up points and the, all the pressure's not on you. Um, you know, and again, I just think that, you know, kids are, oh, they gravitate towards, you know, the it thing. And, and right now, like, you know, Nico's a kind of it recruit and, you know, Tennessee has got to continue to capitalize on that. And, he, and, and he's got to continue to work things in recruiting on Twitter, on Instagram. You know, he has the pulse of the fan base. If, if Nico Iamaliava says, I want Kyler Casper. What do you think the fans are going to do? They're going to love up some Kyler Casper or Carnell Tate or whoever, you know, offensive lineman, defensive lineman. Nico drives the train. He's the leader of all this. Speaking of Kyler Casper, you, you, I mean, you put out some, there were some tweets out showing that some of his athletic ability he guys, guys really good athletically uh, basketball stuff he was doing and, and some things. Um, where do you think Tennessee is with him as he's scheduled to be in a week from Saturday? Um, they've always been in it. You know, obviously it changes with Nico. Where, where do you think Tennessee is? And is Oregon the competition there? They are. Um, you know, uh, you know I, I think Tennessee's in a good spot because right now he's been to Oregon. He's seen Oregon. He didn't pull no trigger for Oregon you know, and he's not been here and he's going to come here with the guy that, you know, conceivably would be throwing him the football. And, you know, it, I, I just think with all the buzz around campus with them having a home baseball series and all that stuff, I, I think that that's a massive weekend for them to really make a huge move there. You know, it, it's, it's kind of like one of those things where like, you know, you don't, or a team, a team in a, in a particular game doesn't have the lead, but they have all the momentum and you just know how this thing is going to end. Like Tennessee right now to me is, is quietly got all the momentum. Now, again, Instagram still, I would say more predominantly Oregon than it is Tennessee, but Tennessee started to make a move in that regard. And those are things you have to watch. I mean, you can't put every, every ounce of stock in, you know, what a kid's tweeting or Instagramming. Um, But at the same time, you know, I think that, you know, the fans and, and, and the love they show has a huge impact. And I think Tennessee's fans can have a huge impact on Kyler Casper, especially heading into that visit, getting him amped up for the visit uh, by showing that he matters here to, to Tennessee fans. Ben, you can jump on in here as well. Did you, either one of you guys think that um, a home baseball series could be at a recruiting advantage for, for a Tennessee football program? But it feels like no. if, Tennis, if Tennessee can do some damage against Vanderbilt, that Missouri series got a chance to be really crazy and, and could be a help to Tennessee in football recruiting. Couldn't you mean it? one, you mean one in five Missouri? <laughs> if ten, if Tennessee's coming home for the first time in two weeks and having won two series against the two best. Oh no, teams, I agree with you. I just said this, it, it sets up well because you play back-to-back -back really tough game series right. on the road. And then you play the two worst teams, at least record wise, Alabama and Missouri the next two weekends. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it can absolutely help. I never thought I'd see the day, especially when I was sitting up there covering some Dave Serrano uh, baseball games. But Tennessee should absolutely help, or Tennessee baseball, that is, should absolutely help the football program. And I, I think it's just the, the simple fact of being in the environment, being on campus. Austin can speak to, to, to Nico's family and just kind of how much they, they fell in love in Knoxville that weekend they were here just because it was good weather 
outside and, and just being around town and, and meeting all the different people and just the atmosphere is just awesome. So I, I think that's the biggest help, just I'm just against little old Tennessee fans are, are going to be hyped up and they're, they're well aware of which recruits are in town. So I just think the environment will help. Now I'm curious to see how Tennessee football goes about doing it because they put those permanent bleachers in and those little areas down the left field line are no longer there. I, I guess also they stick them out there on the porch. I don't yeah, know what, potentially. Yeah, I don't know what they would do there, but you know that they're, if anybody wants to go see that, they're going to find a way to make that happen. Just like uh, we, we saw the basketball home game environment help Tennessee for that junior day. A lot of guys were talking about that, that, that these, these sports are feeding off each other pretty good. Uh, and they feed off this town, and this town right now is pretty excited about a lot of things in regards to the Tennessee athletics, including the Tennessee baseball team that's number one in the country. They're in action Wednesday night at home, then back on the road in Nashville. Tough ticket in Nashville. Good luck finding one of those for Tennessee and Vanderbilt for what should be a monumental series. We'll get you ready for that coming up later this week. Full coverage of recruiting, full coverage of Tennessee football spring practice. That's all at ballquest.com. That's going to do it for this Tuesday edition of the VolQuest.com podcast for brought to you by Smoky Mountain Organics. For Austin Price and Ben McKee, I'm Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest podcast every week here on VolQuest.